Good morning, everybody. Welcome back after the first midterm. And hopefully you have had a good weekend. Uh, so since we just finished the first midterm, I'll go ahead and announce the next midterm, which is gonna be on April, April 14th, Wednesday. April 14th, 2021, that's a Wednesday, okay? So next midterm is up just a little over a month from now and structure of the midterm is gonna be exactly the same as the one you have had for the first midterm. And the final exam is going to be on the last week of the semester, okay? Final exam is gonna be on the last week of the semester. And also I will, for the final exam, I'll give you two days to work on the final exam. For the midterms I've been giving, I've been giving you about a day or so to work on it. But for the final exam, you'll have two days. And someone mentioned that a review before the midterm was helpful. I'll go ahead and hold a review before the next midterm on April 13th, which is a Tuesday. And time is gonna be the same, maybe 7 p.m. Okay, so let's shoot for 7 p.m. Uh, 7 p.m. on Tuesday, or should I make it six? Do you guys prefer six or seven? Mm -hmm. Any um, preference? Seven was okay. Seven. seven. Okay. seven? Okay, uh, I'll stick to 7 p.m. So uh, April 13th, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, review for the second midterm and April 14th, the re uh, second midterm and the final exam is gonna be on the last week of classes, which is I think 15th, May 15th through 22nd. So May, no, May 17th, sorry, May 17th. So May 17 through 22nd, there's the final exam, last week of classes, okay? And during that week, I'll probably give you open the test sometimes here during this week on this window of time. Uh, May 17th, I might open it and keep it open until May 19th or so, okay? Or I, I'm also flexible. If you guys wanna get it done, I'm okay also opening it um, on May 15th, which is a Saturday, okay, May 15th, uh, and close it on May 17th. I'm pretty flexible, all right? Uh, we'll talk about it more, but the final exam is gonna be during this time, during the last week. All right, having said that, let's go ahead and talk about the materials for the day. We are gonna talk about expected value, remember, uh, we are kind of in the second half of the semester right now. Uh, we are gonna talk about expected value, then we are gonna go into continuous random variable. We talked about random variable, okay? Now we are gonna talk about continuous random variable. There are two types of random variables. One is discrete. So far we kind of have been talking about discrete random variable. And then next we are gonna talk about continuous random variable. Under the continuous random variable, we are gonna talk about uniform distribution and normal distribution, okay? Under continuous random variable, we are gonna talk about uniform distribution and normal distribution. And after that, we are gonna talk about confidence interval, hypothesis testing, and linear regression. And that's kind of what we will be covering. In the confidence interval, we'll probably do single population and multiple populations, same for hypothesis testing. All right. Okay, so now expected value. What is expected value? As the name tells you, the name is pretty good. Expected value. On the average, what do you expect in a random process? Okay. In a random process, what do you expect on the Average, that's what the expected value is. The way we define expected value, the notation for it is E of X is equal to summation 
x times p of x. Okay, summation x times p of x. What is x? x is the actual value that we are looking for. And p of x is the probability that that value would happen. x is the actual random event or value that we are looking for. And p of x represents the probability that that event will happen. So x could be your head or tail, right? Let's say x could be head. Let's say we denote head by one. And or your x could be tail in a random process of tossing a coin and we denote tail by two. So what is your summation? X times P of X on the average, what can you, what value can you expect? If you are tossing a fair coin, it would be E of X is equal to summation x times p of x. Now I have identified the x values by one and two. There is nothing unique about it. You can identify it by zero and one or five or seven, eight, two and three, who knows, whatever you feel comfortable about, okay? But I just identified x to be a random variable that could take on the values one or two, one representing head, two representing tail. So let me create a simple table. That's the best way to learn this expected value. X is your event here. In this case, the random event one getting ahead. Probability of getting ahead when you toss a coin is 50% or one half. So X is one, P of X is one half. So X times P of X is one times one half is just one half. The next event that could happen when you toss a coin, you could get a two or you could get a tail. So there's gonna be one half, right? Probability of getting a tail. So two times one half is just one because two and two cancel out. Now, what is this thing? This is nothing but sum of this. So you add them up, that is your summation x times p of x, which is one half plus one, which is one and a half or 1.5, okay? That's one and a half or 1.5. That's what it is. If you remember this example that I gave you, you should be feeling very good about expected value. Just always create the table, x, p of x, x times p of x, all right? And this number, by the way, when you toss a coin, coin you will either get one or two, you'll never get 1.5. You should know that, right? But on the average, that should be the value. Now, if I were to change this thing to something else, it doesn't, this is not uh, written on stone, okay? X P of X, X times P of X. Let's say you define head by zero and tail by one. In that case, it's gonna be one half times zero, which is zero. And one half times one half, one half times one is one, one half. So then your summation x times p of x is gonna be just one half, okay? Which is your expected value, e of x. Uh, once again, just to remind you, expected value is on the average, what do you expect if you repeat a random process for a very, very large number of times, or in theory, infinitely many times. Expected value is what do you expect from a random process, okay? When you repeat that process extremely large number of times, or in theory, infinitely many times. And I gave you the expected value example for 
tossing a coin. Uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and give you another example. Um, roll a die. If you roll a die, what is your expected value? Okay. If you roll a die, what is your expected value? If you roll a die, what are your outcomes are? One, two, three, four, five, or six. These are all the outcomes that you can expect, right? Now, x, p of x, then x times p of x. Why am I doing this? So that I can get this thing. This notation is summation. This is summation, meaning you're adding over product of x and the corresponding probability of x, okay? You're adding over all the possible values of x, okay? With its product of the corresponding probability of x. And this summation notation tells you. And this table is the easiest way to get that done. When you roll a die, what do you get? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's all you can have. What is the probability that you will get a one when you roll a die? It's gonna be one out of six. Very simple, you know. Now one times one out of six is one out of six. Again, if you roll a die, what is the probability that you'll get a two? It's one out of six. It's gonna be two times one out of six, which is two out of six. I can simplify it, but I'll just leave it as it is so that I have a common denominator. Similarly for three, the probability that you'll get a three is one out of six. It's gonna be three times one out of six, which is three out of six. And if I keep doing it, six out of six. So my summation, x times p of x, which is the expected value. That is the expected value E of X is gonna be one out of six plus two out of six, three out of six, four out of six, five out of six, plus six out of six. If I simplify it, what do I get? Six. Uh, <clears throat> Five, 10, 5 plus 6, 11, 15, 18, 20, 21. 21 out of 6. Uh, 3 goes into 6 twice, 3 goes into 21, 7 times, which is 7 out of 2, that is 3.5. So the expected value E of X is 3.5. If you roll a die, your expected value is 3.5 on the average. Now, that begs a very interesting question, uh, which is this. By the way, when you roll a die, will you ever get 3.5? Okay. When you roll a die, will you ever get 3.5? The answer is, no, you will never ever get 3.5 when you roll a die because the possible values for outcome when you roll a die is one through six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. You will never ever get 3.5, okay? Yet, on the average, when you play this game or when you uh, perform this random process, you will get 3.5 as your output or value, not output, <laughs> the value, expected value on the average. And similarly, for, uh, for uh, tossing a coin, 
Now, you might be thinking these these things are uh, well, kind of simple examples. Yes, it is simple, yet it is very powerful. Expected value calculation is very useful in the real world. I'll just give you some examples, a quick example. Uh, <clears throat> now we are, so we, we are in the middle of uh, uh, once in a century or maybe more than a century event, the COVID-19. Um, and healthcare is a big issue. You know, healthcare is driven by uh, money from insurance, okay? You pay insurance premium when you get sick, they're supposed to uh, give you money back so that you can um, pay your medical bills. Now, the question is, how does it work? How does insurance work? Insurance technically use expected value, okay? Any insurance, it doesn't matter be it health insurance, be it car insurance, be it home insurance, be, be it life insurance, it's all expected value. It is all expected value calculation. So they find the probable, find some event X and find the corresponding probability that that event will happen. So X could be the event that you get sick. Okay, X could be the event that you get sick. And P of X is the probability that you will get sick. So X could, may, maybe the, the better way to put it is this, not X is the event that you are getting sick. Uh, uh, let me phrase it, I have a problem like this. So. X is the money that they pay out, the insurance insurance company. Let's say you get sick, the insurance company pays out $3,000, okay? I'm just making it nice number. X is the event that the insurance company pays out $3,000. P of X is the probability that they will pay out $3,000. Now, what is P of X? P of X is the probability that you get sick, okay? P of X is the probability of you getting sick. That's, that's, the, that, that's what it is. This is kind of very interesting. If you look at it, um, I, I kind of feel pretty amazed by this fact that, wow, uh, there is heavy mathematical calculation, probabilistic calculation uh, in healthcare or any insurance. And uh, this is pretty neat, I think. So they have to dole out three thousand dollars, the insurance company and P of and when when do they give the money? Um, they give the money when you get sick. Now X is the probability, uh, P of X is the probability that you will get sick. So if you add this up, that kind of should give you what is the expected return for an insurance provider. So this. This is very simply simple stick calculation. Okay, I simplified it to the level where it's extremely simple. Of course, real world scenario is a lot more complex. Okay, but conceptually, this is what they are doing. It's the same thing. Um, your X could be that in a car car accident, they are giving out three thousand dollars. Okay, P of X or the probability of X is the <clears throat> well, probability of X represents the probability that they will have to give out $3,000. And when do they give it out? When a person or, or an individual gets in a car accident. Okay, that's what it is. Similarly, home insurance, X times P of X. X is the amount of money that they pay out. Let's say it could be $10,000 for a home, some, some event has happened, like uh, the home caught in fire or something, then P of X is the probability that the home will catch in fire, okay? So the product of this is the expected value. And I have given you three different examples. Now keep in mind, you may think, oh, this is just insurance. By the way, the biggest industry in the US economy 
Does anybody know what it is? Biggest industry, biggest sector, okay? Not industry, biggest sector in the US economy is, anybody knows what it is? It is for sure not technology. What do you think? Or what you may be thinking? It is healthcare. Healthcare is the biggest sector. And the second biggest sector is education in the US economy. Okay. And these are big, big, uh, big time sectors where a lot of money. Healthcare is probably $2 trillion or something, maybe $3 trillion, I don't know. Education is like $2 trillion industry. And then of course, later on comes technology, this and that. So healthcare is a big driver of economy. Insurance is a big driver of economy, any insurance. In a, in a mature economy, in a developed economy, such as ours, the US economy, Insurance is a big driver of economy, okay? And when you are talking about insurance, you have to talk about probability and expected value. So if you learn statistics, maybe you could go ahead and work for um, insurance company, okay? Data science company. So these are great opportunities. All right, any question before I move on, anybody? All right, if no questions, I'll move on to the next one. Oops. Expected value for rolling a die. Okay. This problem may have a little bit of a technical error, but I'll go ahead and do it, that's okay. American roulette is a form of gambling where there are 38 total slots labeled one through 36, then zero and zero, zero. Calculate the expected return for a gambler who bets $1 on five. The return is 35 times if five shows up, okay? The return is 35 times. And there is a little typo on this problem or typo or technical error, uh, whatever way you call it, um, which uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do the problem here so that you can see it. But when you do the problem in the system, go ahead and use this one. This might be a little bit confusing or maybe I'll, I'll change the answer. So when you play roulette, what happens? X is the actual event. P of X is the probability that that event will happen. Then X times P of X is the product of these two things. When you are playing roulette, you probably have been to Vegas, right? You did gamble. When you play roulette, what happens? So you bet how much? $1. So, that means you're losing $1, right? If you're betting $1, you're giving $1 to the house, right? So you're losing a dollar. What are the chances that you lose that dollar? Um, anybody knows what are the chances that you'd lose that dollar? One wants to volunteer, anybody? One in 36, or? Uh, who is talking? Oh, Jerry. So there are like, there are there 38 total slots or are there? One 38. Three? Okay, 38. so wouldn't it be one, um, one out of 38? Okay, good, Jerry. Anyone else wants to try that? Anybody else wants to try this? What are your chances of losing the dollar, okay? You're giving a dollar away. That means they're not gonna give it back to you. Okay? Nobody else?
All right. Uh, let's say um, the other scenario. If you bet a dollar on five, if five shows up, you get return of 35 times. So that means you're gonna get $35. So this is where the error is. This is $35 I put here, okay? Technically, this is not $35. It's $34. Why? You already paid a dollar, right? So that's the error. Um, if you look at it that way. So it's a slight, it's going to make a slight change in probability, but we are not going to worry too much about it. So what are your chances of, Jerry, what are your chances of winning $34? That would be the remainder. Wait, no, I, I actually I don't know that one. Sorry. Think about it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure. Sorry. Okay. Your chances of winning, when do you win? When five shows up, right? So what are the chances that five will show up out of 38 of them? One out of? Seven times. One out of 38 times. Okay, so these are labels. You don't think about them as numbers, right? As far as I'm concerned, um, the, instead of using numbers, I could use cats, dogs, horses, or names of um, 38 different items. So, so she these was are right. Jerry was she, right, right? Uh, what is it? She was right. That's one uh, thirty-eight. No, she was wrong. Oh. She said one out of thirty-eight for this one. Your so chances. Sorry, go your, ahead. Your chances of winning would be one out of thirty-eight. Okay then your chances of losing is going to be what? Thirty-seven out of thirty-eight. Your chances of losing the dollar would be thirty-seven out of thirty-eight. Your chances of losing the dollar is thirty-seven out of thirty-eight. Whereas your chances of winning thirty-four dollars is one out of 38 because you win only if the number five shows up right the number five is selected in when they roll the roulette that's when you would win and it's a random event like right? all the numbers are equally likely to happen so your chances of landing on five would be one out of 38 there's your probability or your chance of winning $34. On the other hand, if anything else shows up other than five, then you lose your dollar, which is what? 37 other remaining numbers, right? So your chances of losing the dollar is 37 out of 38. Now, if you multiply it out, negative one times 37 out of 38 is negative 37 over 38. Then 34 times 1 over 38 is 34 over 38. If you add these two numbers, that is your expected value or E of X, which is summation X times P of X, right? That is going to be equal to negative 37 over 38 plus 34 over 38, which is negative 37 plus 34 over 38 or negative three over 38. So negative three over 38, so let's see. Let me use the calculator. Three divided by, three divided by 38 is approximately point negative 0 0.0789, okay? So let's say on the average, you lose eight cents, negative 
0.08, okay, means if you play this game many, many times, on the average, you will be losing what? About eight cents. Is this clear to everyone? Do you follow me? On the average, you will be losing eight cents. Now, the typo, the, the mistake here is this number should have been 34 instead of 35. If you do 35, that probability becomes slightly higher, about 0 0.05, okay? I mean, your expected loss becomes negative 0 0.05. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what it is. Now, this is the fundamental principle based on which the gambling works. All the houses in Vegas, that's exactly what they're doing. They are doing expected value calculation. Now, there are millions of people playing roulette, right? On the average, let's say you lose eight cents, you might not think that's much, but when millions of people are play, playing this game and on the average, they are making eight cents at, that adds up, okay? Those, those uh, uh, casinos, they never sleep, right? Until huh, COVID-19 came in, then they slept for a while. But um, still, I don't think they are they're, they're closed. Even during the COVID-19, they were, and they were closed for a brief period of time, but I think they're back in action now. So you can see <clears throat> when you play slot machines or any of those, they do these expected value calculations. And on the average, as a player, on the average, as a, as a player, you never will have positive return. This is negative. Do you see the sign negative? your expected return is negative. What this tells you is that on the average, you'll be losing money. On the average, you will be losing money. That's what it is saying. If you lose money, who wins it? The house wins it, right? And that's how the casinos make money. And the exact same principle goes into insurance. If you buy a car insurance, home insurance, boat insurance, life, ins life insurance, and health insurance, biggest of all, your expected return is always going to be negative. Your expected return is negative, meaning someone else's expected return is positive. That someone else is no one but insurance provider. That someone else is no one but the house or the casino that makes money off of you. That's what it is. Clear, everybody? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and do the same problem again. So this time you bet a dollar, you bet two dollars, okay? You bet two dollars on 17. And the return is 17, uh, return is 35 times. It's the same thing, I guess. I just put two dollars, isn't it? Uh, so American roulette 38, okay, level this. Calculate the expected return for a gambler who bets $2 on 17. The return is 35 times if 17 shows up. Yeah, so exact same calculation, the numbers change. So let's just take the background off. Your X, P of X, X times P of X or probability of X. By the way, P of X, as I talked about, you should be thinking of it is like F of X function, okay? P of X is a probability function with certain constraints, characteristics that we talked about. This is always restricted between zero and one, okay? And some of all the probabilities, some of all the probabilities must add up to one, right? Or integral, if you have taken calculus, negative infinity to infinity, P of X, DX should be one, or all of this. So anyway, P of X, think of it as a probability function. I will not be saying it all the time. P 
of x is probability function like f of x represents a function that tells you the function f depends on the value of x. Similarly, the probability function p of x depends on the value of x. Here, x is just variable. Here, x is a random variable, okay? Now, what could happen if you're betting $2, right? You're betting $2 on 17. First, you could lose $2, okay? Or the other thing, you could win 35 times. So 35 times two is 70, right? You could get $70. Or if I take away $2, that's gonna be $68. These are the two events that could happen. Now, what is the probability that 17 is gonna show up? Is the same probability that five is gonna show up in the last problem. So it's gonna be one out of 38. What is the probability that 17 will not show up? In that case, you lose your $5. So that's 37 out of 38, okay? If you do the multiplication, this is gonna be a negative 74 over 38. This is gonna be 68 over 38. I'm multiplying this and this, okay? If I add this, that's gonna be my expected value, E of X is equal to summation X times P of X. There's gonna be negative 74 over 38 plus 68 over 38, which is what? A negative uh, six over 38 or negative three over 19. So three divided by 19 is gonna be point 15. Did I do everything right? Negative 15, seven, eight, or roughly about 15 cents you're expected to lose on the average. So if you play this game many, many times in theory, so this is negative, sorry. Uh, many, many times in theory, infinitely many times, your expected return, your expected return is gonna be about negative 15 cents, meaning you are losing 15 cents from your pocket or from your wallet, right? If you lose 15 cents, who wins 15 cents? The house or the casino owners own 15 cents. And that's how you should be thinking. This is a very, uh, very interesting concept. This doesn't apply only to casinos. Um, let's say X is the event that you graduate from college for, you know, graduate from college and let's say get a, make, let's say 100K, I'm just making it up, okay? So it could be 100,000 times the probability of X. That means probability that you will graduate from college and land a job. See, this is something completely that is related to your life. It's hard to quantify this probability. Not hard, you, 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 you can reasonably quantify that probably, I guess. But it is something that impacts your life. This expected value calculation, you're always doing in your mind subconsciously without realizing you're doing it. Okay, I, I plan to finish Hartnell College in two years. So you are kind of like, um, wishing that you would graduate from Hartnell College in two years. That's a probabilistic event. It might take two years or it might take more, it might take less. So that's a probabilistic event. So you need to make sure that you not only, you not only think of this concept in terms of uh, mathematical or business or, uh, or in terms of the economy, but you should be thinking of this concept, expected value, okay? Um, in your life too. When, when you're going out, let's say you're going on a vacation, you're doing expected value calculation. How is the weather gonna be when 
or where I'm going. Should I be carrying a, rain, a, carrying a raincoat or an umbrella or whatever? Or even as simple as, okay, what is the weather going to be like today? Should I, is it, is it going to get cold in Salinas today? Uh, later in the day, should I be carrying a, you know, something, some extra clothing with me or something like this? So you, you're going, ahead, you're go, going this kind of calculation all the time. These are expected value calculation. These are probability given. Okay. Um, but you are doing it subconsciously. You are doing it and not using math. Okay. You, you are not necessarily using mathematic mathematics and sitting down. Um, and finding the probability of uh, temperature falling below 55 degrees and you taking the <laughs> t-shirt, extra t-shirt or extra sweatshirt with you, all right? So um, you should keep in mind, expected value calculation is very important. Uh, what is the expected value calculation for you lending a job for $100,000, okay? or doing certain things in your life, etc. So enough of this uh, talking. Uh, let's go ahead and do a couple more problems on these uh, interesting problems, and then I'll go ahead and finish it. So here is my favorite one. Uh, this is the health insurance. Um, and then the, this is another one which is kind of cool. So we'll do these two problems and then finish this expected value calculations. So health insurance is a good one. So let's say you buy an insurance, okay? The probability, so I'm here right now. So the probability that randomly that a randomly selected person who buys health insurance from you will get sick and charge $3,000 per year is 60%. If the yearly insurance premium is $10,000, then who, who do you think wins? The insurance provider or insurance buyer? That is, find the expected return for the policy. So you pay $10,000 for, for your health insurance. The chances that you will get sick during the year and collect a premium of $3,000 is 60%, all right? A randomly selected person will get sick and collect insurance premium, $3,000 is 60% chance. So now what is the expected return for an individual? That's the question I'm asking. Now, keep in mind, this is this calculation is for an individual. It is possible that one particular person um, spent $2 million on a health insurance uh, claim because he, he or she got really, really sick. But that is not what we are talking about. We are talking about on the average, a typical insurance buyer, what is his claim? There are people uh, who are spending $100,000 in medical bills, and there are people who are spending $0 in medical bills, right? In that case, what happens? Your $10,000 is gone. Uh, somebody else is getting $100,000. So what we are asking on the average, what do you expect an insured person to spend? That's what we are looking for. And as a health insurance provider, that's what you're more interested in. Um, uh, when you're doing basic fundamental calculations, uh, overall business strategy or business policy that you are calculating, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do the problem. I'm just gonna take the background off here so that you can see it. So X, P of X, then X times P of X. X is the event uh, that you get $3,000. Hopefully you don't want it because that means you got sick. What is the probability that it will happen? Okay. Uh, so the probability of that's happening is gonna be 60% or this is 0.6. So X times uh, P of X is gonna be 0 0.6 times um, 3,000, which is 1,800. 
The other event is that you lose uh, $10,000, okay? Uh, so $10,000. Now here again, technically you could argue, is it 10,000 or 7,000? Um, so, because you're getting, uh, getting 3,000 back on the average. So I'll put 7,000, okay? That'll change the probability, all right? Um, but I'm not too worried about the details of this calculation because uh, any, in any probability problem, sometimes things could be uh, argued about, okay? So let's say we are, we are talking about $7,000 because even though you're paying $10,000, but technically they're giving you back 3,000, so remaining is $7,000, okay? So what is the probability that you will not get sick and lose 7,000, which is 40%. So 7,000, negative 7,000 times 40 is negative 2,800. If you add this, there is gonna be your expected value E of X, which is summation X times P of X. Okay. And there is gonna be negative $1,000. All right. Is gonna be negative thousand dollars. Now let's go ahead and look at look at it. Uh, kind of do a little bit of analysis of this problem. What is the analysis? This is the analysis. All right, you are losing. $1,000, so negative $1,000 your expected return. Who wins that $1,000, okay? Or who gets this $1,000? Obviously the insurance provider or the insurance company get $1,000. On the average, a typical person is expected to lose $1,000 when he or she buys a health insurance. However, that $1,000 is positive or profit for insurance seller or insurance provider. Now, they are not selling one insurance, by the way, okay? So there, this is where the numbers become crazy, crazy profit. So you're thinking, oh, okay, I feel good. I'm spending $1,000 on the average as a consumer. I'm spending $1,000, I'm getting health insurance, which is an extremely good thing, okay? This is perfectly fine. Now, as a business, think of it that way. As a business, think of it this way. Now, you don't sell just one insurance. What if you sell 1 million insurance, which is pretty common for big time health insurance providers? That's pretty common. 1,000 times 1 million is, by the way, $1 billion. So they just made $1 billion. And it's not unlikely for big health insurance providers to make billions of dollars. And by the way, when you pay health insurance, it's not $10,000 you pay. You pay actually more, all right? Um, so that's, that, that's how you should do the calculation. Like for me, I think I pay health insurance about $25,000 for the year. Now, which part of it I pay, part of most of it paid by my employer. So that's, that's how it works. Any question, anybody? No question, everybody's okay? All right, now let me clean it up. Here you see when I did the calculations, I used 10,000, so make sure. Um, I, I should probably change the answer to this problem. So, okay, so just a clarification. If you do it with 10,000, I will not penalize you, okay? The system, that means the system will not penalize you. All right, the last one is uh, similar. So this is an interesting problem. What is it? This is the one bond problem. Assume that you have $10,000 in bond, 
there are two types of uh, assume that you you're investing ten thousand dollars in one bond there are two types of bonds available the first bond gives you seven percent return with a default rate of three percent and the second bond gives you nine percent return with a default rate of five percent which one of these bonds would you consider for investing your ten thousand dollars assuming assuming that you want to maximize your profit that is find the better expected return between these two bonds now two bonds available to you two options two investment options now here is another domain where expected value becomes very important the entire retirement system in the us which is trillions of dollars okay your retirement money of uh, people, those who are folks, those who are investing your retirement money into different assets, different asset classes or their different uh, uh, investment vehicles. What they are doing, they are doing expected value calculations. And these guys are not dealing with one or $2 million. They are doing it billions and trillions of dollars, okay? So they really have to do serious analysis in their investment strategy so that their expected return is good okay they want to maximize their expected return and i took that concept and created this problem for you so that you can see it in the context of a very simple real world scenario you as an individual you have ten thousand dollars you have two investment options one is a bond that gives you 7% return with a default rate of 3%. Another is a bond that gives you 9% return with a default rate of 5%. Now, what is bond? If you don't know that, I'll talk about it at the end of this problem. But bond is another. Bond market is another extremely powerful uh, driver of economy. Okay, US bond. US government is always issuing bonds. Okay. Even our lovely city of Salinas is always issuing bonds. So we'll talk about it after the problem is done. Now, if you are not a careful or savvy uh, investor, or if you are somebody who doesn't do a lot of mathematical analysis, might say, oh, this is 9%. I will take 9% over 7% any time, okay? If I have to invest $10,000, somebody is giving me 7% versus another person giving me 9%, I'll always take 9%. The answer is not so simple. As a matter of fact, in this context, you will see if you take the 9%, you are actually on the average making a worse investment decision. Okay. Going for the 9% is a worse investment decision compared between the two. Okay. Better of the two is actually 7%. Why? Let's do the problem. So I'm going to create x, p of x, x times p of x. So there are, so your investment horizon is one year. That means you invest the $10,000 for one year. So let's consider the first case, 7% return. That means you will get 7% of $10,000. So 7% 7 Seven percent of ten thousand, which is by the way seven hundred dollars. Okay, how do you get it? Point zero seven times ten thousand, which is seven hundred. So this is going to be one case is you are going to get seven hundred dollars. All right. One case is $700. So what is the probability that you will get $700? Okay, even before I get to that, uh, one case is $700. But by the end of the year, if the bond issuer goes out of business, you actually lose your $10,000. That's, that's another possibility. One possibility is that when you invest in the bond if the bond issuer goes out of business in one year then you lose your entire investment 
And there is a chance that it will happen. And that chance is, by the way, 3%. That's the default rate. That means bond issuer defaults on your bond. In that case, if they can't give you $700, how are they gonna give you $10,000 that you gave them? So there is a chance of that happening. So there is a chance that you lose all of your investment is 3% or 0 0.03. Okay, and that's gonna give you negative 300. 0 0.03 times 10,000 negative is negative 300. If your chances of losing $10,000, 3%, what are your chances of gaining $700, which is the complement of it, which is gonna be 100% minus 3% or 97%. If 3% of the times they go out of business, the company goes out of business or the bond issuer goes out of business, 97% of the times they do stay in the business. So if they do stay in the business, then they're gonna give you $700. So 700 times 0.97 is gonna be 679, 679. And if you do the math, it's 379, your expected return. So if you invest $10,000 in a bond, your expected return is 370. Nine, and that's the first bond. Let's call it bond A. And the bond B, which is this one, let's call it B. In this case, what do you get? You get 9% return. So one option is, so let's use a different color so that you can see. One option is you get $900. The other option is you lose $10,000. So what are your chances that you lose $10,000, which is 5%, by the way, default rate for the second bond is 5%. So it's gonna be 0 0.05. So 10,000 negative, negative 10,000 times 0 0.05 is negative 500. If the chances that the bond issuer is gonna go out of business is 5%, the chances that they will stay in the business, there are two things that could happen. Either they stay in the business or they go out of the business. The chances of going out of business is 5%, which means the chances of staying in the business is 100% minus 5%, which is 95% or 0.95. So 0.95 times 900, which is 855. So 855. If you add these two numbers, that's your expected value or expected return, which is summation x times p of x is 355. So the, this is where you got your expected return in the second case is 355. Your expected return in the first case is 379. So your choice is pretty clear. You want to invest. If you're a rational investor, who wants to maximize profit, you'd invest in this one, the first bond, even though they have a lower rate of return, which is 7%. So that's how you should be thinking. Is this okay, everybody? Yes. And while you are here, I will be giving you a problem like this in the next midterm, so that you know expected value problem. Okay, so to summarize, you can see how important the expected value calculation is. There are many facets of life where you're using expected values. There are many realms of your life, many, many things that you deal with in, in life and economy and everything, you are doing expected value calculation, even though you probably have never done it um, mathematically the way I did today in the class until today. But now you have the, not only you have the intuitive understanding of expected value, you also have the mathematical foundation of expected value. 
now you are more powerful, okay? You are more knowledgeable. That's what knowledge does to you, okay? It gives you power. But you have to make sure, which I tell you, knowledge by in and of itself is not good enough. One of the things um, I tell my students all the time is this, um, it's good to learn, okay? But make sure that you apply it where you can make sense out of it in the real world. And most importantly, think of money, okay? Well, one of the very basic lessons that I have learned in life, but it took me many years to learn, knowledge by itself is not good enough. It has to bring money because at the end of the day in this world, whether you admit it or not, money drives everything. It may sound very materialistic, but no, it, it is a fact. We go by the fact. We don't go by emotions. We don't go by um, what people say. We go by what is fact. Money is the biggest driving force in your life. There are many problems that you see in your life that could, those could be addressed if you had money. Okay? You are working very hard. You are tired. You, you are unhappy. Why? You don't have money. That's why. So what you are learning, always think of business, think entrepreneurial mindset, okay? Have an entrepreneurial mindset, have a business mindset. Whatever you are learning, can you create a business out of it? Can you make money, okay? Uh, if, you are, if you are gonna be a nurse, you are doing it right away. You are actually an entrepreneur because you're studying to learn some skills that skill you will apply um, in the healthcare industry and you will make money. So that's exactly what you're doing. And in many cases, people, when they're studying, um, they're not sure how to apply it in the real world to make business sense or to think of money. So I, I always encourage you to think money. For many, many years, I personally haven't paid much attention to money. Uh, you have to Pay attention to money. Let's say your biggest investment is going to be buying a home, right? Home. What is your expected return on buying a home? That's, you probably don't think of it in terms of expected value, but you're buying a home. That's the biggest investment for an ordinary person. And what is the expected return on it? You may not do it in terms of X times P of X and sum it over. But in your mindset, oh, okay, you're thinking, if I hold the home for 10 years or five years, I might, it might go up to, I bought, bought it for $700,000 now. If I hold it for 10 years, it might go up to $1 million. Uh, I'll be making $300,000. When you're doing this calculation in your head, all you're doing is expected value calculation. You're applying the knowledge of probability and certain event happening probability of certain event happening. X is the event that your home appraises at $1 million. And P of X is the event that your home will be, or the probability that your home will be $1 million. So that's, that, that's what it is. You don't do the calculation like this, but you are intuitively doing a lot of mathematical calculations in your head. You guys don't realize it. All right, enough uh, for expected value. And that's all for the semester for expected value, other than do, answering your questions. Now we are going to talk about continuous random variable. Before I jump into continuous random variable, one last chance for everybody. Anybody has any question about uh, expected value calculations? Anything that I could answer? No one has questions, everybody okay with it? Eric, any question? No, no question. Gloria Ortiz, any question? No question. Jerry? No, you're good, thank you. <laughs> I'm good, okay. Are you good? <laughs> Yeah, it's just a phrase. I know. All right. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the next uh, uh, topic, which is continuous random variables. All right, um, X is a random variable. What is a random variable? A variable whose value comes from the outcome of a random press process. We talked about random variable. A random variable is a variable whose value depends on the outcome of a random process. Easiest examples I gave you is head or tail. Head could be labeled as zero, tail could be labeled as one. Or rolling a die. If you roll a die, your X values could be one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? Or your X could be the number of questions you get right in a multiple choice quiz, okay, MCQ, then let's say you, your MCQ has 10 questions, so your X could be one, two, three, up to 10. Or uh, if you are administering some COVID-19 drug to let's say 1,000 people, your X could be one, two, three, all the way up to one, thousand do you see what do you notice about these x values anybody notices anything interesting about these x values anybody the pattern keeps on going they probably keep on going the pattern it's a pattern it's a pattern okay they don't keep on going for sure in the at least in these examples It's a pattern. Uh, can you be a little bit more specific, Araceli? Because you know how it's going from zero, one, and then one, two, and it keeps on going to like six, and then for the next ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, and it keeps on going. But okay. I think that's right. That is the correct idea, but there is a vocabulary that I've been looking for that's called discrete. These are discrete values okay this random variable has been taking values that are discrete certain values it is not taking on any value like for instance the in the first case it could take on two values only zero and one it couldn't take on anything else it couldn't take on 0.5 that's unacceptable the same for any of this it cannot take any fractional values it would take whole numbers as values or positive integers as values. And that's called discrete random variable, RV for random variable, not recreational vehicle, RV random variable. Now, so far we have been in the realm of discrete random variable. Now we are gonna jump into, guess what? In the realm of continuous random variable. There are scenarios where variables that <clears throat> variables that we are dealing with are continuous in nature, not discrete. For example, um, the number of uh, hours a person studies, okay? A college student, the number of hours a college student studies in a day on the average, that's not discrete anymore. It's a random event because is different for different people. There is no rule to follow, right? Some people study 10 hours a day. Some people study two hours a day. Some people study zero hours a day. It's random, right? So it's a random event. So now this random variable X in this case are not discrete like these ones, but rather continuous. Generally speaking, okay, General, generally speaking, uh, this random variable X, continuous random variable is gonna be coming from the number line, okay? Which is from negative infinity to positive infinity, okay? And this is a typo technically. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not get into this right now, but I'll talk about it later. Um, uh, so probability, of a single point in the continuous case is kind of a unique scenario. 
Okay, it's a mathematical concept that leads to something interesting. Uh, for continuous random variable, probability of a single value, let's say x is equal to a is always zero. Okay, but for now, ignore that we are gonna talk about it later. But when we are dealing with random variables that are continuous in nature, our values are gonna be coming from the number line. Number line goes from positive infinity, uh, zero to positive infinity to the right, and zero to negative infinity to the left. So your X values are gonna be coming from the number line or from, is gonna be from negative infinity to positive infinity. It's gonna be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, in the discrete case, we kind of have a formula or rule for defining probabilities. I mean, finding probabilities associated with the random variable, like for binomial distribution. For binomial distribution, we had a formula, probability of x equal to, let's say, some number a, okay, which was ncx p to the power x times one minus p to the power n minus x. In the continuous case, you have, I mean, in the discrete case, you have formulas like this. In the continuous case, we do have also formulas, but those formulas are a lot more complex and involved, all right? Um, and also probability function for continuous case is also known as probability density function, or sometimes we call it density function, okay? Probability, continue, probability function for a continuous random variable is also known as density function or probability density function. So let's say some interesting facts about continuous random variable X. You do not find probability for individual X values as you did in discrete cases, what I was exactly talking about. You do not find probability for individual values in the continuous case. You rather find it for an interval because individual probability, so, prob so let's correct it again, probability of x is equal to some particular value a is always zero for continuous case, unlike discrete case. In the discrete case, it's not true. For the continuous case, probability of a single point is zero. So probability that someone studies exactly seven hours a day, exactly probability of x is equal to seven is gonna be zero. Even though it kind of doesn't make sense, but theoretically it does come out to be this when we, the way we define probability for continuous case. And it will make sense to you once I give you the definition, which I haven't yet. So you pro find probability for an interval. So fi find the probability that someone studies between five and seven hours, okay? Probability that a randomly selected student, a college student studies between five and seven hours a day. The probability that a randomly selected student studies between five and seven hours a day. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about it. The next thing that I wanted to mention, probability that some randomly selected student studies less than seven hours a day is the same as the probability of X is less than or equal to seven. So adding this equality doesn't change things. So what is the difference between the, this and this? So when I say probability of X is less than or equal to seven, that means I'm saying probability that X is less than seven plus the probability of x is equal to seven. But probability that x is equal to seven is zero, right? So then if this is zero, we can cross it out. So that means it says that probability of x is less than seven is the same as the probability of x is less than or equal to seven. So in a nutshell, if I say that probability of a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b, it is the same as saying probability of A is less than or equal to X, less than B, or probability of 
A less than X is less than or equal to B or probability of A less than or equal to X is less than or equal to B. All of it, all of these are the same because adding the equality does not change the probability for the continuous case, for the continuous case only. For discrete case, yes, it does make a difference. So make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. For the discrete case, it does make a difference. For the continuous case, it doesn't. And the first topic we are gonna to talk about is uniform distribution. Uniform distribution is defined as follows, okay? A continuous random variable X has a uniform distribution over the interval. It is defined over certain interval, A to B. F of X is one over B minus A, if X is between A and B. Otherwise, it's defined to be zero, okay? F of X for Uniform distribution one divided by B minus A. If your X value falls within the interval that we are talking about or within the interval under consideration, otherwise the value should be zero, okay? All right, now mu is the expected value, okay? Mu is the expected value expected value, oh, by the way, this is something I forgot to mention. When I say expected value, it is also known as mu or the average value, expected value, okay? Mu is the average value or expected value, okay? Now, mu for uniform distribution is A, plus B divided by two. Mu for uniform distribution is A plus B divided by two. And the variance sigma square, variance is sigma square and standard deviation is the square root of the variance, which is sigma. Variance is A minus B whole square divided by 12, okay? Variance is A minus B whole square divided by 12. Now, this is a great example for understanding continuous random variable and how continuous a probability associated with continuous random variable is defined. And I'll give you some examples here. And once we do this problem, you will get an understanding of continuous random variable definition, probability associated with continuous random variable. And let's go ahead and do it. And this is the example I use. Let's say your school has decided to test the fire alarm, okay? And they told you it's gonna happen between 10 and 11, okay? Between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. You know for sure that it, this event will happen, okay? During this time, all right? Which is, to say that there is a 100% chance that it will happen because they have already pre-announced it. We are gonna do a fire alarm testing during 10 and 11, between 10 and 11 within this hour. However, they will not test it before 10 or they will not test it after 10. It will be only during the window of one hour between 10 and 11. Now, so that means there will be some probability of this happening, there will be P of X is uniform because during this time, it could happen in any time, okay? During this time, it could happen in any time, but outside of it, the probability is zero. It's not gonna happen. This is zero and this is zero. Only during this time, it will happen. Now, this probability is 100% between 10 and one, I mean 10 and 11, the fire alarm will be tested and there's a 100% chance that it will happen. So 100% is one. 
So this area of this rectangle, the area of this rectangle must have to be one, okay? So, so let's say for simplicity, uh, uh, to break it down, this is the 30 minute mark. This is the 45 minute mark, okay? Let's put a colon in front so that you don't get confused. This is the 15 minutes mark, 10, 15, 10, 30, 10, 45, and 11 for 15 minute windows. So there are 60, there are 60 individual units between 10 and 11 or 60 minutes. So your height should be one over 60 because this length, remember the area of a rectangle is measured by its, by the product of its height, I mean length and weight, in this case, height and weight, okay? So this is gonna be one, I mean 60, not one. So 60 times one over 60, 60 times one over 60 should give you 100. So this entire area, this entire area is one. So the, that's the probability. So in the continuous case, probability of an event is defined by the area under the curve or area under the density function. So P of X probability is defined by the area under the curve, is defined by the area under the density function or density curve. Different people use different terms, it's the same thing. Uh, under the probability density function, I'll write it, write it out. probability, area under the probability density function. Area under the probability density function. Okay, that's what it is. Is the probability under the density function. Okay. Now, uh, what is the, so if you ask the probability question, what is the probability that exactly at 10.30, the alarm will go off. So that's why we need to we need to kind of ask this interesting question. So 1030, which is right here, what is the probability that at 1030, at exactly 1030, the alarm will go off? So if you think of the probability as an area under the curve, so think of from now on, is the probability is the area under the density function or density curve. In this case, you have this green line, right? Which has a height, of course, one over 60. What is the width of a single point? The width of a single point is zero, which gives you zero. So that's why the probability of a single point is zero, is the way we have defined it, okay? The way we have defined probability for continuous random variable. So this green line, has a width of zero. It has a height of 160, one over 60, right? It has a height of one over 60, but width of zero. So that gives you a probability of zero. So it is true for not only 1030, it is true for any single instant, okay? For any single point, the probability of that single point is always gonna be zero and that's the reason. Now, what is the probability that the alarm will go off within the first 15 minutes? So that means you're asking the question, okay? Zero is less than X is less than 15, okay? Within the first 15 minutes. So 15 minutes is here. So area is gonna be just this portion, right? This green shaded region. What is this length? This length is 15, right? Because it's the first 15 minutes, 15 times the height is one over 60, which is one fourth because 15 goes into 64 times. So probability that the alarm will be 
tested within the first 15 minutes is going to be one fourth, which is the same as 25% or 0.25. Okay, that's what it is. All right. Um, now, let's say, what is the probability that X is going to be greater than 45, which means what is the probability that the alarm will be tested within the last 15 minutes, which will be this, right? So you find this area. So there's going to be, again, the width is what? 15, right? And the height doesn't change, it's uniform, meaning height is the same. So 15 times one over 60, sorry, one over 60, which is one fourth. 15 goes into 64 times, right? Which is 0.25 or 25%. So there is a 25% chance that the alarm will be tested within the last 15 minutes. What is the probability that the alarm will be tested within the, so let me just draw another, another curve quickly. This is your 10 and this is your 11, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And this is your height. Okay. What is the probability that it will be tested within the first 45 minutes. That means X is less than 45. What is the probability that will be tested in 45 minutes? So this is your 45 minute mark. So this, so you're looking for all the area to the left of it. Okay. This is what you are looking for. So now again, your height is one over 60, right? And this length is going to be 45. It's going to be 45 times one over 60, which is 15 goes into 45 three times and 15 goes into 60 four times or three over four, which is 0 0.75 or 75% chance that it will be tested within the first 45 minutes. Or I could ask you, what is the probability that it will be tested between 10.15 and 10.45, okay? So I could ask you the same question, which is gonna be, what is the probability that X is less than, uh, 15 is less than X is less than 45, which is, so this basically is asking the question, what is the probability that it will be tested, okay? Alarm will be tested within the first 30 minutes, not within the first, first 30 minutes, within the uh, time window of 10.15 and 10.45, okay? So again, we are gonna go ahead and draw something. This is 10, so this is 11, that's 15, that's 30, that's 45, right? So you want to check the alarm. Okay, between 1015 and 1045. So it's gonna be between these two. So 1015, 1045. So we are looking for this area. Again, I am shading all this region just to emphasize the fact that probability in the continuous case is always defined as the area under the curve, okay? I want to make sure the importance of understanding the definition. Always in the continuous case, shade the appropriate region to make sure that you follow, make sure that you follow what the definition says. It is the area under the curve is the shaded region that you are looking for. I'm looking for this shaded region, which is a rectangle, right? This example is very useful and very important for understanding uh, continuous random variable and how probability 
is defined with continuous random variable is easy, simple, and yet visual example. So in this case, we want to find out uh, the probability that the alarm will be tested between 1015 and 1045, which is this shaded region. Height is one over 60, right? That didn't change, one over 60. And this window is 15 to 45 is 30, right? So times 30. So 30 goes into 62 times. That's one half or 0.5 or 50% chance. So there is a 50% chance that the alarm will be tested between 1015 and 1045. This should give you a solid understanding of continuous random variable, okay? And how probability is defined for continuous random variable. Now, let me summarize what I, I have talked about. We have defined continuous random variable, right? Defined continuous random variable, okay? A continuous random variable is a random variable whose value comes from a, from the real number line, okay? Whose value comes from the real number line. And of course, it's a random variable. That means it's associated with the random process, okay? Number two, probability is defined for random continuous random variable as defined as the area under the curve. Probability is defined as the area under the curve. And maybe another thing, probability of a single point, probability of a single point is always zero for the continuous case, okay? For the continuous random variable. So these are the things, and we talked about uniform distribution. Is defined over a closed interval A, B, right? And for the uniform distribution, density function, for the continuous case, we call it density function, F of X is equal to one over A, sorry, B minus A, if, X is an element of A and B, or zero otherwise. Okay, I, I don't think I'm doing a good job here in terms of writing too many things, but it's clear, you can see it. Obviously, red is pretty, pretty clear to see. So I have shown you different scenarios, different examples of how to find the probability associated with the uniform distribution. And um, for uniform distribution, um, mean is A plus B divided, uh, divided by two and standard deviation e variance is A minus B whole square divided by 12. So for uniform distribution, mu is A plus B divided by two and variance sigma square is A minus B whole square divided by 12. So these are the things you need to remember. In our case, mu would be 30. Why? Because we go from 10 is zero, 15, 30, 45, 60, right? So we have technically defined it between zero and 60. So our mu is gonna be zero plus 60, divided by two, which is 30. Our variance is gonna be sigma square is equal to 60 minus zero whole square divided by 12. 60 square divided by 12. 60 square is 3600 divided by 12. So 36, 12 goes into 36 three times, so it's 300. So your sigma square is 300. So sigma square is 300 
which means your sigma is going to be square root of it, right? Sigma is square root of 300, which is 300 square root is 17.32. So that's what it is. All right, good. Any question about this, anybody? Anyone has any question? No question, everybody is okay? No question, everyone okay? AJ, are you okay? Okay, looks like everyone, everyone is doing good. Alicia, any question? No questions. Okay. All right, I think I have given you plenty for the day <laughs> to absorb, uh, let's see. Should I cover anything new? Maybe not, okay? Uh, there's plenty of, plenty of work for the day. So uh, for the today and uh, day after tomorrow and the day after, you may want to look at these topics that I covered today, expected value and continuous random variable. And then we are gonna go ahead and continue with the continuous random variable and we're gonna talk about normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. And just to give you a heads up, this is the density function for Gaussian distribution. And of course, uh, I'm not gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna be expecting you to uh, remember this, uh, but I would expect you to understand and remember the properties of normal distribution. What is a normal distribution? It's a bell-shaped curve, okay? A curve that has that shape. And this is the formula. At least you should be able to identify it when you see it, okay? I don't want you to memorize it, but it's not that complex, by the way. Uh, you should be able to identify the um, formula and be able to remember and apply, particularly apply the properties of normal distribution into real world problem, into solving problems, okay? And we'll talk about it uh, in the next class. And if you want to get a little bit of heads up, um, you may go ahead and look at this. And we are gonna revisit the, um, revisit the uh, empirical rule again. Now you will be more knowledgeable about it. Now that we are going to be actually talking about normal distribution and different properties of normal distribution, you will see how these things work out. And we'll do many problems involving normal distribution. So this is the beginning of more mathematical and more real world oriented part of the class, uh, which is uh, a lot of application of normal distribution. You really want to make sure that you understand normal distribution. So uh, make sure to ask me questions, make sure to do the homework and bring in your questions to the class. And so, uh, that way you will get a solid understanding of the topics, all right? And go ahead and look, look at these examples and the discussion before the class on Wednesday. And we'll go ahead and talk about normal distribution in details. You'll get enough of plenty of normal distribution throughout this semester. And after normal distribution, we'll talk about sampling distribution and the central limit theorem, okay? This is a very important topic. Central limit theorem, as the name implies, is central to the understanding of statistics, okay? That's why we call it the central limit theorem. All right, that's all for today. Thank you so very much. You guys have a wonderful rest of the day and next couple of days and we'll be talking on Wednesday morning 8.30. Okay. Thank you and bye. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Wait, Professor, I have a question. Yes, please. But but it's not the this today's lessons. It's about the midterm review. For one question, 